Welcome to the Go One More Step podcast. I'm Brian White. I'm a veteran, I'm a survivor of my brother's suicide, and I'm talking to people about overcoming challenges of all kinds. And welcome to the podcast, John Preston, defensive coordinator for Whiteland High in Indiana, also uh, educator and molder and shaper of young minds and hearts. Something like that, yeah. Full disclosure, my cousin. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, thank you for for doing this. Um, And, you know, as we discussed, you represent kind of a new direction the podcast might take where I've been I've been talking about talking to folks about their individual stories and I know you've got some stuff that that'll come out on that but it also occurred to me that you're helping young people young men and women figure out resilience and perseverance and doing hard things and starting that habit young which I think is awesome (laughs) and so I really want to explore that and kind of hear from your perspective what that means and what you think you're doing for these kids. Yeah, absolutely. I, well, first of all, I was a little, uh, when I went and looked at all your stuff, I, I, I saw all the cool people you were interviewing. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know why Brian wants to be a high school coach, but here we are. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it defines me really. Uh, it, it's who I am. Um, I've always wanted to be in education. And we'll, get into that. Mm-hmm. we'll get into the backstory and everything like that early on, but uh, I didn't know what the full realm of education was i knew i wanted to impact young minds and that's all it was and, and i'll be honest with you uh there are so many better teachers out there than me i i am if you ask me to go to trivia and, ask, and, and repeat a bunch of history knowledge for you and stuff like that i'm awful at it i really am uh mm-hmm. but what i do pride myself in is being able to build a connection with kids and being able to help shape them and kind of help them develop um and especially like you said kind of at a young age I was doing it at the college level um mm-hmm. and I, I didn't really feel as though I was as big of an impact as I wanted to be um and that's kind of what got me into the high school realm eventually later on um but now you know taking a kid that's you know 14 15 a freshman in high school um and watching them develop over four years watching them move on to college you know I'm going through graduation all these graduation parties right now and kids that I've seen for the last four or five years here right. and that's where I find my, the most joy of what I do is watching those kids uh develop who they really are becoming they're going to be and watching them move on and, and develop their own path and story and all that and, and so that's really what I love about what I do uh mm-hmm. it's really what I think I am at what I do or how, how I am the best at what I do kind of thing um but yeah I love it that's awesome dude um if I can ask how yeah. many do you stay in touch with post-graduation oh I hundreds uh hundreds I, I I still stay in touch with um so I coach college ball before this I, I still stay in touch with all those guys uh I stay in touch with the kids that have graduated from the first year I was here on so, so, yeah. okay, so you're, you're taking a, a very active role yeah, I, I think one of the best parts about being coach is uh, coach never stops. Um, and so whether they're, you know, I, I coach all the way down from our youth leagues when they're second graders and on. Uh, and then once they graduate, like uh, we got kids playing college ball right now that still kind of reach out to some advice because, you know, I went through it, I've been there, and I kind of, I, I, I'm happy that they still reach out and that yeah. uh, we're still going forth. Uh, I have a couple that are married now, which makes me feel old. Um, so I, we're, <laughs> we're getting there, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it that that kind of stuff sneaks up on you. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there 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 are guys now retiring that weren't on active duty when I. Right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, so you've got you've got kind of a tagline that I see you throw up on social media a lot. That I think I have my ideas on, on where I think you're going with it, but I want to hear your take. What does it mean to go one and zero? Yeah, so it actually is, I, I mean, I won't be, I'm not going to say I came up with it. I mean, vocally used it at Wisconsin. Um, the guy I got from was my kind of mentor in college when I was playing. Uh, but to me, you know, where, where, the, where people get mad at it is when I post and stuff like that is, it, you know, they think it's just, you know, winning a game or a scrimmage or whatever. Uh, but what I tell our kids all the time is 1-0 is, is so far outside of just the score of a game. 
Uh, one and zero starts when you wake up in the morning. Are you setting the alarm clock and hitting the alarm clock, getting up, or are you hitting snooze? Are you, you know, getting up and checking the day, or are you letting it kind of? Are you feeling yourself, feeling your way through the day, kind of thing? Uh, it, it's how you do anything, uh, and it's how you do everything, right? So go one and zero. I tell them all the time, you know, it's in the classroom. So we're sitting up front. It's are we doing our homework? Are we missing assignments? Are we, you know, being respectful of teachers, stuff like that? Um, it's the stuff that. Yeah, everyone sees the score of the Friday night game, uh, but they don't see every time you went one 0 in practice, you know, in a rep, and anything you do uh, to achieve that ultimate goal of uh, winning the game, essentially. Right. So, yeah. how much crossover do you see when you get these when when you get these kids starting to form good habits, say in the weight room and and on the practice field? How well does that carry over into into other academia and into life? Yeah, so uh, I have three kids that I've sent to the college that I went to um, that, uh, you know, obviously they hold a special place for me kind of thing where, you know, uh, they saw where I came from, what I developed from, and now they constantly are getting reinforced the same message kind of thing throughout their whole entire career. Um, but kind of like you said, you know, it's not a just on the field thing for me. I'm in the weight room with our guys. We actually have a, a full lifting class with just a football team and they're lifting during the day. And, and so watching the kids develop in, in there, because that's where it all starts and seeing it all progress throughout their career uh, and, and just continuing the mantra of, you know, I, I, I'm actually incredibly proud. We, uh, uh, we started a lacrosse program. I have a football player that um, hasn't played varsity ball yet, but this should be his year, right? Uh, but he started playing lacrosse for me a couple of years ago when I started the whole thing. And the other day we, we were playing our last game and things just weren't going as well as I had hoped. And, and you know, the kids felt it and they, and they kind of knew it. And it was a game that, you know, they were just very lacrosse players, basketball, whatever. And our guys started to, the rest made a couple of judgment calls that could have gone either way. And the guys were feeding off that kind of thing. And they were kind of losing their minds a little bit. And he, who hasn't been a leader yet for our team, uh, you know, he's only a sophomore or junior rising senior. He slowed the game down. And he told a bunch of guys that were seniors graduating kind of thing, like, don't worry about what the call is. The score is like, if we just go 1-0 and on every rep we do, if we get the ground ball, if we make the pass, just do what we need to do, everything else will take care of itself. And, and so that's where I'm like, I step aside. And I'm like, okay, that's a kid that, one, he hasn't been the starter leader for me yet on my defense kind of thing, but he gets it. And so, you know, as I'm looking forward to the football year, I'm like, okay, that that we're going to build up. That's my guy right now because he, he's got the mentality we need. He might not be the best football player on the field. Um, he's pretty good, but, you know, we have other guys around that play more than him, but that's going to be the dude who leads our defense because he gets yeah. the mantra. He gets what it means to be to go one zero essentially. Yeah. So how 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 tall were you on the field when you heard that? Uh, well, I was. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, that was a good one. I, I was pretty excited. I was like, uh, you know, there, there's moment. constant times, yeah, throughout the years that you know you kind of, you're kind of reminded of, okay, this I'm, I'm doing it right. I'm doing the right thing. This is why I'm here, and and I'm I'm doing something positive, making a difference. And that was definitely one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw the go one and own and and I was I was pretty close in my interpretation. Like that, yeah. that it was like, yeah, when get the small wins, make the right choices, make the right. do the hard now for yeah. the easy later rather than the easy now and the hard later. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And and it's you're right. It, for, I mean, for a football team and, and for a lot of us, it starts in the gym. It's it starts yeah. in the street, it starts in in moving the body. Um, yeah. And that's a big thing for me. So the, the crossover was was pretty easy to to, yeah. to you know, and, and I've got my own like mantra: the, the go one more step. Like you know, when when and and I got it kind of from um, Churchill. You know, when you're going through hell, yeah. keep going. And that was just like when when you're at that point where you think I don't have another mile in me, you right? Know, but you've got a step. Yeah, and absolutely. Step, and you've got yeah. Step. So. Our our, uh, our program model for football, our, our head coach, Darren Fisher, is, and we can, you want to talk about leadership, and do, that dude's the best thing that's ever happened to me. But mm -hmm. uh, his mantra for the program, and it's not just high school. I mean, we, 
we coach youth league to high school and we're very involved in youth league. Like, so they wear the same, the same thing we have the back on, on our back of the neck of our jerseys. They wear down the youth league and it's break the rock. And I don't know if you've ever seen the, the picture of like two miners and uh, they're both kind of mining for diamonds there. And one's like super close and turns around and bails on it. And that's what yeah, that's right. one swing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And so that's been his mantra here for the last 28 years or however long he's been here. And he tells the whole story, you know, we have a youth league every summer and every winter with the kids where they come get coached by us one night. And my favorite part of the year is every year at the last practice for them, uh, our youth league, he, he, they all take a knee, all 200 whatever of them that are there for that day. And he just shared the story of Break the Rock. And it's been the same story for the last 20-something years. And it, it ties in with the one and oh. Yeah, it's like we got to take care, just keep pushing head down kind of thing and just keep going one and oh. And eventually, you know, although you don't see the diamonds, in, you know, behind the barrier right. there, the dirt, like it, it's going to, you're going to achieve your goal. Yeah, that's, yeah. And, and I don't know who it is, so I'm not going to try to quote it verbatim. But, there, you know, there's there's a quote attributed, and I, and I want to say it's sport related, where like, Nobody quits at the beginning and the end. Yeah. Everybody's right. excited to start. Nobody quits when the fit when you can see the finish line. It's it's in the middle yep. That, yep. That, that the character reveals itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're we're exploring resilience and, and on a personal level, but um I, I think also you've got some personal examples, but I I'll really what what came to mind was your town got slammed not long ago. Yeah. With a series of tornadoes, and what struck me was how very visibly, obviously, and quickly your town was a community. Yeah, yeah, it it was amazing. Yeah. So, uh, so where does that start? Does that also yeah. go in the weight room? Because I I I got <laughs> the sense that your kids were driving a lot of that. They they were. So it it's been uh, for Whiteland, Indiana. It's been the hardest year you could ever imagine. Um, we've had five students uh, pass away this year. Uh, we had the tornado um, that wiped through throughout the, through the town in, uh, during our spring break. Um, but each step, you know, I, I moved, when I moved here and decided I wanted to coach in Whiteland, um, you know a little bit of my backstory, but like I didn't grow up in the small community town. Like I was from the mountains of New Hampshire, essentially. And so I always wanted to be someplace where Friday night football was a thing, where the town, the town was a thing. Where, and, and that's really what Whiteland is. And so this tornado pretty much came kind of unexpected. I remember I, I had two football coaches here at my house. Uh, we were having dinner and such, and they live in Whiteland. I, I'm about 15 minutes outside of Whiteland. Um, closer to into the city here and their wives started to call them and be like hey there's a tornado come and get home and they're just laughing it off like they're like yeah tornado like midwest yeah we always get tornado warnings and then they drive home and about 2 a.m in the morning um we're supposed to go back to school for after off spring break the next the two days following but 2 a.m that morning this tornado just comes through and whiteland's not a massive town mm -hmm. uh, but and it has a very small town center uh, the tornado goes right through essentially the town center. Uh, yeah, it destroys. I mean, I've never seen devastation like that. Like, it, it was just wild. I mean, factories were gone. Uh, they had to shut down pretty much every road in Whiteland. You couldn't get through. Um, and I just remember, like, I, I woke up the next morning, and my, one of the coaches called me. His house had been kind of destroyed and stuff. Like, he needed help. Like I grabbed my chainsaw and I was down there and told the cops it was my father so I could get through the barriers and everything to go help him out. Um, and you're right. I, the community had never, it, there wasn't one person complaining, one person. I mean, you, you know, I don't want to say people weren't asking for help. They were, but they needed help. It wasn't like, you know, there wasn't a false sense of, you know, entitlement or I need help or something like that. It was all just genuine. And you're right. Uh, the football team now, I don't want to dismiss it. There were, plenty of others. I mean, softball team was out there, volleyball team, but um, my football guys were, I, I couldn't have been more proud. Uh, I mean, we had, you know, we got a lot of farmers. We're, we're a big farming community. And mm -hmm. I, I remember like uh, a kid that's going to be the quarterback uh, just grabbed his trailer uh, and grabbed up 10 kids and they just started to go town and it started to, to you know, load up stuff. Um, we were out there. I mean, it, it really took about a week and a half just to clear everything, the roads, uh, clear the debris, stuff like that. And it, it was, 
it was amazing. Um, my, you know, we had people from all over sending us stuff. Uh, my parents, my family, uh, sent us a bunch of supplies, stuff like that. Uh, we actually had too many donations. If that's mm -hmm. kind of weird to say or to, I believe, but like, uh, there was stuff that was being turned away. Um, I remember like I, I went and bought, uh, the morning of, I went and bought $200 worth of donuts from up here because we were un uninfected. And I was going to bring them to the, the town center to just give the families and whatnot. And there was already too much food there. And so I had to go bring them to the cops and everyone. And just I was like, just give it to whoever you want kind of thing. But it was, yeah, it was amazing. Um, still, a lot of the town is really destroyed right now, um, which is unfortunate. But we'll, we'll, we're going to be stronger from this. Um, we're we're going to constantly talk about like, the rebuild and, and us coming together as a town was, I want to say it was worth it. Fortunately, no one got hurt from this tornado. Uh, right. But to see us come together as a town um, really made made me proud. I know it made a lot of people proud, and, and it, we're a lot tighter because of that. So interesting question to explore because the, there is no right answer, right? Um, it, times like that don't build character. They reveal it when, when it's yeah. that fast. Absolutely. Um, and so if the focus is like the immediate response, help the people who needed help. And now you're coming together even more as a community and the focus is on rebuilding. Mm -hmm. What do you attribute that to? Because that, that scraped away something and revealed a bedrock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it kind of just reminded the town of, you know, it, we're in a weird weird time period in, in society right now, right? Um, and I, I don't want to say that we were divided before, um, mm -hmm. but there were people going in all different kinds of directions. And I think it kind of just revamped the town, reminded them that, you know, everything we've done, every, the school, the, the you know, I, I'm going to mention football. I'm a football coach, so I do. Uh, but, you know, as a football program, everything we built here in Whiteland started with this town. And we have to kind of get back to that. And so I, I, you know, simple stuff like, why would we go to eat in Whiteland when there's 10 other restaurants down the road? Well, we go to eat in Whiteland because that helps Whiteland, you know? And so get back to that kind of the basics of what makes this community so special and what made us so special and makes us special. I, I think is kind of what, what that show a little bit of is mm -hmm. we need to get back to what started this town to get, get where it is now. And especially as we continue to grow, I mean, we're a growing town, it's getting bigger and bigger. You know, we got a new school coming in four years here. Um, we got to remember kind of who we were and where, where that came from. Okay. So farm community. Yeah. Pretty rural? Very, very well, rural. Um, yeah. it, and, and to ask delicately and a little bit clinically, a lot of, of kids, what kind of socioeconomic background are we talking about? Uh, we are incredibly socioeconomically diverse. Uh, and problem to, uh, to be honest with you it's one of the reasons I mean you you know kind of where I grew up from and I was very blessed very fortunate yeah. um, and it, it's the opposite uh, truthfully but it's what makes what it's why I do what I do and why I don't want to leave um, it, it, I there's kids that I deal with on a daily basis that go through stuff that you know I could never even fathom having to deal with yeah. and they show up every day and if those kind of kids can show up with going through that kind of stuff, I, I, you know, what do I have left to complain about? And that's, it, it's hard. You know, I, we fight battles. I'm not saying no one else fights. Um, but when we have to do things like I'm worried about making sure a kid has breakfast mm -hmm. and you're worried about whether or not he's ready to play in the football game. Like I, I, I'm trying to take care of like, we're, we're fighting two different battles here. Like, I'm just trying to get them to the game, essentially. And again, it's, it's what makes us, we pride ourselves in it. Uh, we, we think that a lot of people we play, uh, I'll be frank, we're tougher than them. And it's because we go through things that they don't have to. And we pride ourselves in that. And so it, it's it's hard. Um, we are growing. We're a school about, uh, we're a little over 2,000 right now. In the next four or five years, we're going to be way higher than that, probably. Um, we got a lot of, you know, you got the, we're just south of Indianapolis, so you're getting a lot of people starting to move down south a little bit. Um, and so it's a growing population, very diverse, incredibly diverse. And that's one of our biggest struggles right now is uh, we got a lot of kids going to school with one another that didn't necessarily go to school with one another 10 years ago. Right. right. So getting them to kind of learn different cultures, uh, di different types of people, how people act, stuff like that is, is a challenge. Um, we got massive uh, Sikh population. 
uh, which is a great thing. I mean, they, they bring a whole different side of Whiteland that, again, 10 years ago wasn't here, wasn't as strong as it's now. Uh, but they're a good portion of our population right now. And so learning to adapt to, you know, that kind of stuff, we, we are having, you know, we, we were in the news, I want to say a year ago, uh, because um, unfortunately we had a racial altercation between an African-American male and a Sikh kid, and they got in a fight and the turban fell off. And to the Sikh population, that's a massive, massive, um, like, religious thing. They, that just can't happen. And so we were in the news for a while. And, you know, we've had to do a lot of uh, training outside of just being a teacher, uh, which sounds weird, but teaching is so much more than just what happens in that classroom. Um, but, yeah, it, it provides for It's a challenge every day, for sure. Um, do you think you're better for it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I was coaching college ball uh, in, in Chicago, like mm -hmm. pretty much south side of Chicago. And that was really my first experience of um, kids that were less fortunate and just dealing with those socioeconomic challenges. And I fell in love with it. Um, you know, I, I went to a boarding school. I'm not going to hide it, who I am, when you know, it helped make me. Um, but I never saw that type of stuff until, you know, I, I had players that were spending every penny they could just to be in the college itself and right. like I had to I had to come to an understanding of okay I can't have them every day because they have to go work four or five days a week or something like that and, and because they're, otherwise they don't get to go to college and so like dealing with that kind of stuff to where I am now where you know I've had to help kids with basketball forms uh, you know help I, we can go through the laundry list of you know help feed kids take care of them all that kind of stuff but um I like solving problems and I, I have to solve problems kind of every day in what I do now. So that, that's an interesting point. And, and our, a little bit ago, you talked about the kids where it's, it's a fight to show up um, yep. where, where like you and I, and, and I grew up in damn near the same environment you did um, yep. just as lucky. Um, and, and I'm starting in, in my, my old age, as it were, to think that, you know, when you have that kind of struggle, when you have those kind of problems to solve, they're tough. The solving of the problems, the showing up becomes in its own way, a tool to growth. Absolutely. Um, and like the more problems you solve, the more problems you're able to solve. And, and I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of people who have more privileged backgrounds that just don't have enough problems to solve. And so they start inventing problems. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I, like, I, I often wonder, it's a little bit of a chicken egg thing. Is, is right. this not winning the battle or is it also. Right. Right. Helping, helping them, helping them grow. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, my life could have gone in a bunch of different avenues. Right. But you know, when I, when I went to the boarding school, I, I was incredibly fortunate, went to a great college uh, and, and so on from there. But had I not, gotten into this and saw what real problems were I mean like you I, I kind of I don't fear change I look forward to it so I, I haven't lived at home since I was 16 uh, I've lived in four different places uh, and I'm you know only 30 years old right now and I, I always like to move around just because I like something different every now and then and, and so that kind of set me up on the path of not you know having new problems but having to face new things everywhere I kind of went you know whether, whether I'm in the south side of Chicago or when Indiana I, I'm willing to look at different perspectives and find different avenues and had I not done that had I not traveled around as much and left home and I, I didn't leave home but not lived at home since I was 16 I don't know if I'm looking at this and being where I am right now and as happy as I am right now because I'm seeing real problems and yeah I, I it's helping me put into perspective how fortunate i was and mm -hmm. how tough these kids are and it again it just helps drive me like it, it you know we can talk through stories but if some of these kids go through some of the things they've gone through in life and come out better for it i can't get mad I, you know i can't be pouty for waking up in the morning you know and going to work so and 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 realizing there's some sensitivities here the stuff these kids are going through mm -hmm. and they're getting through it and, and they're coming out on the other side stronger. What coping mechanism, what are you seeing them do to get themselves through this? Uh, so I have two kids and their story was just shared on, they just did an article about them. And, and so I don't think they'll be upset. I should this. Um, 
so one individual, mom struggled with substance abuse when he was really young, uh, moved from area to area, uh, never really had a father. I uh, was in our school, actually went into a uh, juvenile facility for a while uh, because he was um, not going to school essentially. Um, and so he gets out, he's fortunate enough where his aunt and uncle uh, adopt him. And his uncle just happens to get a job as the assistant principal in Whiteland, Indiana, when he's a freshman, going eighth grade, going to the freshman year. And he's probably the best leader I know. I mean, that, that dude as a leader in that academia is phenomenal. Um, but this kid, I, I mean, he's lived with a parent that struggles from substance abuse where she put drugs in front of him for so long. Mm -hmm. And he shows up and don't get me wrong, he's blessed with some athleticism. He's 6'4", 220, runs like the wind. Uh, and phenomenal punter. And, and the other kid uh, moves to Whiteland from Florida, moves to Whiteland when he's in, I want to say sixth grade, I'm probably getting that wrong, sorry. Uh, but he comes here, uh, mom and dad both pass away. Mm -hmm. Moves in with grandma. Grandma passes away when he's in ninth grade. Jesus. And so, yeah, so now he's left here, no family, nothing, but ends up moving in, you know, one of the, I want, again, I don't want to say I'm, proud moment but one of the coolest things was was when that all happened there were 30 people that were willing to take it in this kid okay and so again he comes luckily he's taken in by uh one, one of his teammates uh was living with them for the last couple of years both are going to go on to play college football and not pay a dime right now uh they're phenomenal kids they're going to be both uh, you know both are going to college oj will be the first one in his family uh dalton i think will be the first one from his immediate family essentially um those were probably the two best teammates we had on the state run team, uh, the state title team. Uh, they, they just showed up every day, and no matter how their day was, they just cared about their teammates and being at football. Is neither one going to go to the NFL? I don't know. That you know, I, I, yeah. they're both good football players. They're phenomenal, but they're better people and they're better kids. And they, you know, we've had, don't get me wrong, like, again, we, we, there were plenty of times where I, I've had moments in our four years together, five years together, where we've had hardships. Like, I, I can tell you hardships I've had with Dalton. I mean, he, getting him to be the mature athlete he is now has, has been a, a long process, but one that I learned more from him than he ever learned from me kind of thing. And, yeah. they, you know, they, we both had, they both had times and moments where they, kind of, I don't want to say they, they lashed out, but they acted out of, you know, maybe immaturity or because they're scared or whatnot. And yeah. they, they just had to get back to who they kind of were. But when you look at all of them and you go ask who your favorite teammate is on, on the team, um, it's no, it, you know, it, there's, it makes sense that they both, you know, we both were best team of the award at the end of the year. It makes sense that they were, both their names are at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. and, and if those, if those kids who have gone through that, and show up every day and be the best teammate. It lets me look to the other kids who, who you know, maybe don't have it so hard and go, okay, why can't you do what he's doing right now? And not that I like to make examples of them, but it kind of just puts it in perspective because everyone knows their source. And when they when that happens, it makes it easier. Yeah, it's hugely powerful when you've got a peer role model modeling how to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before they came along or different, different, year groups or whatever, what, what other techniques, whether, whether taught or just kind of self-developed have you seen? So I, I, I think that's, I don't want to say that's, you know, it's not the wrong way to think of it, but to me, the easiest way to get a kid's respect and get a kid trust you is just be there. You know, I don't think there's a certain technique that you can use with every other, every kid around, you know, I, I can tell you, I might get fired for this. I'm not as five years ago. Who cares? That's the point of that. But uh, we had a kid who um, tweeted out that uh, it was a suicidal thought mm -hmm. and he put on social media and I'm a big social media guy. And so I see it and I don't think twice I go pick that kid up, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I go pick him up. We, we drive around for a bit. I make sure we make sure he's okay. He's a Marine. Now he's doing phenomenal. But having a, there's no technique to get you ready for that. Like that situation could yeah, could I have called, you know, the crisis response people and made sure that I was all financially liable, you know, not liable? What? Great. Yeah, I could have. But the most important thing to me right now is to go pick that kid up. And, and I just think that that's the most important thing is there's so many, you know, 
in, in education, especially you see it, like there's a new way of talking to kids, a new way of this and that. It's like just be there for them. You know, when when the kid that oh boy, this is gonna be hard. Um, we had a student drown about a month ago in our pool. Um, oh god. And yeah, and uh, she was my student um, as a freshman. Um, she had seizures, a lot of seizures. And she had about three uh, in my class, I can remember. And there's, you know, we're, we're taught how to, you know, deal with situations like that. But like when the student's seizuring in your classroom and, you know, she's stuck in a chair and you have to go pick her up and she's in your hands, just lifeless. And you're kind of put, you have to take care of her. You know, and, and, you know, the first thing on my mind is I know she's okay because, you know, I'm ready for this. They prepared me for this kind of thing. But she was more nervous when she gets up and she's going hair and everything. She was more nervous about what her classmates thought. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, she has, you know, she has a serious problem that we need to be aware of. But what I had her do is, you know, the next day I, I had her come up and make, she did a presentation on her disease in front of the entire class because she's like, I really want them to know you know, I really want them to understand kind of what's happening so that they don't make fun of me. And I was like, absolutely. And so the day of, I gave a presentation on it before she didn't even know. And then the next day she does. And, and so just, there is no certain way to handle every situation, but you've got to be there for every type of kid. And as long as you're there for them, you'll figure the rest out. I mean, we're adults, you know, and every situation is tough. Um, but, it, you know, I, you got to just be there. Like I, I have a student who's, um, dad unfortunately committed suicide last week and you know uh, yeah he's uh he's a lacrosse player for me and uh, just a phenomenal kid phenomenal kid and the only I, there's no words to make to make it okay right there's no words to make him feel better you just have to be there for him and so when he's at practice that next day or the same week sorry there's nothing i do but just hug him you yeah. know and, and so and so i, I kind of think that's where I, I don't know if we necessarily get so technique heavy that we lose sense of that a little bit um but that's always been kind of where i've been about you know i'm going to be there for that i'm, I'm going to make sure i build a connection because i'm there not because i i know that you know whatever technique can be used in the situation okay yeah. so you and I are are in many ways of a mind with the, especially with the connection between physical activity, physical fitness, and and wellness, yeah. and health. Um, yeah. So it's it, and, and we could talk for about six of these sessions just yeah. what you're doing with your athletes. Yeah, interesting to hear how you translate that into the classroom to non-athletes. What are what are you doing? Yeah. And what are you seeing? And are you seeing any different? approaches that you use or approaches that they use um you know there, there's been some some tough times at the school in the town yep. how do the athletes treating it different than those who move less so the athletes inherently have someone to go talk to mm -hmm. they when something happens like this yeah. they know that i'm there and I think one of the problems with, and I'm not saying this is a problem with our school, but I, th I think one of the problems with teaching in general is teachers become so hung up on having the perfect lesson plan and making sure that, you know, they, they, put, they put forth the information they want in the best way possible and every learner is, is counted for and all of that great stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm not, trust me, there's a lot of benefits to teaching. It's, I think it's also a very difficult position profession i mean every day i'm going in there and saying i don't know what's going to happen right i don't know it could be you know we like we taught one of the kids uh we had a kid that was gunned down at a bus stop by another student mm -hmm. i don't know if i'm going in that day to hear that news i yeah. and then i have to i have students in my classroom for the next three hours before the school decides figures out what they want to do with the kids that we want to send home or not right i don't know if i go in and it could be a kid's worst day and i'm the person that he decides to unload on right. and so when a when a athlete has a problem they know i can go to a coach and talk it out like i when trust me i am not sick of it but the amount of times i can tell you when and when one of my football players come to me and says this teacher is being mean to me because they don't like me because blah 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 right but there's also 90 percent of the population that doesn't 
know who to go talk to. And maybe out of that 90%, maybe hopefully hoping, right, that 50% of them can talk to their parents. Yeah. That's a large percentage that really has no one to talk to about things now. And so the biggest thing that I do in the classroom, right, I try to do is I build a connection with every kid. And I, I do it so... <laughs> I open it, I, I'm a very, I love comedy. I, I'm a very sarcastic person. It's who I am, right? Uh, the reason being is, you know, my dad, uh, my dad was a Marine for 20 something years. He was the most hardcore person in my life through, you know, age zero to 31 or about to be. Right. The only way that sometimes when I could break that seriousness was through comedy. I, yeah. When I knew like in an intense situation, if I can make mom laugh, dad's not going to be mad anymore. Now it's me and mom versus dad. Right. And so uh, I, I tell them on day one, I, I only have two rules in the classroom. The first is if I'm talking, your phone's not out. Right. Very simple rule. You're not on your phone. The second is I am going to make fun of you. Make fun of me. Like just make fun of me. I'm, I'm, old, I'm old. I can handle it. I'm going to pick on you for certain things. I need you to pick on me. too. The only thing I say about that is you can't pick on someone else. So like, it's me and you dialogue, dialogue kind of thing. And I always, you know, I'm fortunate enough, right? I, I know being in the community now, I always have at least one to two kids in my class that I know every year when they come in through the door. And so if it's a football player, it's easy. I'll get the class laughing at him. And I know he can handle it because he's dealt with me for the last so many years, right? And, right. and I'm not, you know, I'm not making fun of the kid. I, I'm finding something, you know, that, you know, that I know is, you know, within that boundary of it's going to get every, all the kids laughing. They're going to feel more comfortable. And then all of a sudden now they're comfortable in my classroom. Now they're opening up to me. Now they're talking to me. And, and I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm not, again, I am not the best teacher. I can promise you that. But I can promise you that there are kids within that school right now that I have connected with far further than any other teacher or kid within that building because I've gone, at, I'm very comfortable being out of my comfort zone and talking about things that I have either no concept of I don't really care about, but if it makes a big deal to you and it's your passion, by all means, tell me all about it kind of thing. And so I'll have these kids that will come up to me in the hallways and they'll start talking to me and I'll have teachers and kids cut turn to me and go, how do you know that kid? Well, because that kid matters to me in that classroom just as much as the other kids. And so if, if that's his passion, if that's what he cares about, that's what we're, we're going to make sure that that's you know, put on the forefront for him kind of thing. And so that's really the biggest thing that I try and translate from coaching. You know, I'm not making them do push-ups in the classroom or anything, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I will find a way to connect with every individual in that classroom the same way I do on a football field. You know, every kid's different on a football field. There's a hundred different ways to coach them in football. I'm going to make sure that I can connect with every different kid in that classroom as well. Right. So possibly a tough question that I don't apologize for. Yeah. How do you power through the tough moments. You, it sounds like you're really connecting very deeply with a lot of kids and that opens you up to a lot of tough moments and a lot of hurt. Yeah. Um, what are you doing? Oh, uh, that's tough. Uh, I have, I work out, I work out, um, mm -hmm. like you, uh, and that I have to now, um, to get through my day. Um, I have to work out. Um, I am the second best coach in my household. Uh, the first being my wife. Uh, she actually has kind of started as little as lacrosse is known in Indiana. Hockey is le known even less. She was a collegiate hockey player. And mm -hmm. she's kind of starting a women's hockey league, essentially, in Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, and so to do what I do, you have to have the ability to come home, shut the doors, and just talk. And yeah. I think she does a great job with that. Um, she allows me to vent. Uh, she allows, you know, as ridiculous as some of my thoughts or ideas might be, she allows me to spitball and buy her. Um, she's never once complained. <laughs> she's complained, uh, but she's never once complained about the money I spend on kids. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you that over the last six years to start a lacrosse program to do what I want to in football, um, there is a lot of that out of pocket money that I'm very fortunate enough that she allows me to utilize. And she's never complained about that once. Uh, there's other spending she complains about, but not that. Um, and then you have to have a good coaching circle. Uh, you have to have guys that 
don't necessarily have to think like you, um, but they have to be able to, when I, if I'm struggling with a kid, I'm, I'm fortunate enough for my staff defensively and offensively, but my staff particularly is phenomenal. And if I'm having a problem connecting to a kid, there's five other coaches that are going to go take a shot. And so if we have plenty of kids where we know, you know, I might not be their favorite coach or he might not be their favorite coach, but if the other one get them to play hard, you got to, we have to utilize that. And so that particularly, and that helps out a lot, but being able to call somebody, uh, being able to call, you know, guys that coach me, um, other coaches in the profession, stuff like that, bounce ideas off. Um, that allows me to, so I'm not venting to the same people all the time, <laughs> essentially, um, but it, it also helps to spread ideas and, and to get kind of what I need to off my chest in a variety of ways. Okay. And, and you know the numbers better than I do, but they're grim when you talk about the chances of a high school athlete going pro. Yeah, yeah. It's about um, uh, 1% out of high school. 1% out of high school? 1% out of high school. Oh, 1%, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you got a lot of kids who might be viewing that as, if not their only, definitely their most promising economically viable course. And you've got yeah. a problem – You've got to prep them against the yep. probability that it's yes. not going to happen. Yep. What do you think? The only – so we don't ever talk about that, right? If a kid oh. wants to be a pro, they're going to talk about that throughout, okay? And, and, but that's not a sustainable life goal. Uh, right. If you're in the pros or not, you know, if you make it, great, but you're only in there for 10 to 15 years, essentially, right? If you're good, you know, the most, most drop out, most fun after three years. And, and so we never we never talk about that. The only thing we do talk about is graduate. And so that's really our push. You know, we have, I started about three years ago, I started an eighth grade night where we bring our eighth graders in throughout the winter. Um, and I, we meet with, me and the head coach, we meet with the parents and the kids. And we tour them around the locker room, we tour them around the weight room, all that stuff. Uh, but I give the same speech every time of, I don't care how many tackles you make how many touchdowns you score, any of that. The only thing I care about is when you grab, walk across that stage, I want a ring on one hand and I want a diploma on the other. Whatever comes after that is your path. I have, we have kids that, you know, just graduating is an accomplishment. We have kids that know they don't want to go to college. We have kids that we've sent to college that never thought it was a possibility for us. Yeah. And, and all those are different battles. You can't, you know, you can't kind of just kind of like we were talking about, but you can't coach the same kids the same way to have the same end goal there right and so their end goals are all different but what I care about is that you're going to graduate and so we do everything possible to make sure that and we I since I've been we've never had a kid drop out or anything like that but we do everything possible to make sure that they walk across that street with the diploma and so like we, we just had our graduation we had 30 seniors that walked across the stage all had the state you know, runner-up ring in one hand and the diploma in the other took a giant picture it was one of the coolest moments we've had um, but we, we never talk about the, you know, if you go pro again, you're one, you're one out of a thousand, hundreds of thousands of people. Like that's, you're just built different. Like, you know, you, you have that mentality, the right mentality, the right framework and body and the right kind of get after attitude. Like you're going to get yourself to the NFL. It's how can I get you to graduate? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like, I like your use of path over and over and over again um you know when when because this all started talking to veterans and, and dealing with veteran mental health issues and probably my least favorite phrase and i i've caught myself using it with how are you doing i'm in a good place yeah and the more i talk to folks and the more i explore about this the more i hate that phrase because yeah. it's so static yep absolutely um i i much prefer i'm on a good path i'm yes. heading in the right direction um yeah. Because that that really captures it better. Because like, this isn't the movies, right? No. Um, no. These kids walk across the the stage. They get their ring and their diploma. In Hollywood, the movie ends and everybody goes home and right. like leaves their popcorn on the floor for somebody else to clean up. Uh, but that's that's one step on a path. Yes. And that path might have changed direction during their time yeah. with you. They might have changed your path in subtle ways, but you're both walking. Path. Yes, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And their path, I mean, my path changed, right? So 
Uh, I went to Lake Forest College, small little body school. It's actually where my uncle went, John went. I don't know if yeah. you that. Um, but so I had always wanted to be a teacher all my life. Okay. And my junior, Lake Forest would do student teaching twice, but his junior year and his senior year. Um, I had been to a boarding school. I had not been around the type of area and situations I'm in currently, uh, but that was the only education I really knew. And at a boarding school, your one to 10 teacher ratio, uh, you don't take world history, you take literature of World War II. You know, you do stuff like that. So it's run a little different. Very, very positive education. I loved every bit of it. Um, but after my student teaching, you have to, you know, I, I had a the head of our department and you know, we only graduate 10 people that go on to be teachers a year kind of thing. It's a very small program. Um, but I was really the only athlete. And, and I don't want to say she had a problem with that. She never understood that football to me was just as important as academics. Right. Essentially. And so um, we got into it one day because I'm a very opinionated, opinionated person. And I really, you know, you're going to hear my opinion. And I'm going to respect yours, but you're going to hear mine. I'm not just going to bow down kind of thing. And we got into it on, she asked us what we thought the best type of education was. And I said, well, what I just had, my boarding school, you know, I, one to 10 teacher ratio, you know, that's a very positive education. And she just disagreed with me completely. And, you know, I understand what she's saying now. Um, you know, she was trying to get me to understand that the best teachers were in inner city, inner city schools. And, whatnot. and okay, sure, yeah. Um, and so, we have to do a big portfolio at the end of the junior year. And up until this point, I'm on track. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to graduate. And in order to do well on this portfolio, portfolio, um, you have to get uh, an 80 or above. And sorry, it's kind of a longer story. But um, she, I knew I had to do well. And so I had a friend that was in our writing department. And this portfolio is like 100 pages long. And I, it's ended by a thesis on your, you know, your thoughts on education, your ideals, and whatnot. And so my friend, the writing department, I had her read it over and go through and make sure, you know, everything was good to go so I could get a good grade and continue on. So I emailed her to her. She sat literally right next to me and we went through it together. She sent it back. I turned it in. Well, when I turned it in, it showed that this paper was done on this other girl's laptop. And so she marked me down for cheating. And so I have to go in front of this judicial board of education in the, in the college and they deem that I wasn't cheating and that she has to know how go back and grade it. Um, and so she grades it and she gives me a 79 and not the 80. So I can't move on in the process. And so that's where, that was kind of my first real, oh crap, what am I going to do? Kind of change my path right now. And I was kicked out of the education program because this one woman that I couldn't really fight on any further deemed that I wasn't adequate and would go on teaching, whatever. Um, but that's also kind of where I, you know, that step in my path took me to, well, I'm going to figure out a way to do this. And here's where I get into college, college coaching, because I, I got my master's through it. But if I didn't do that, if I didn't go down that path, I don't coach college football. I don't have some of the connections I do now. I don't learn that. I'd much rather be dealing with the problems and issues I'm dealing with now than mm -hmm. going and teaching it. Like I was going back to the boarding school. I, I was yeah. set. I'm going to go back there. I'm going to do that. If I don't go into college coaching, I'm not at Wayland. And that was all part of my, in my path, essentially, that brought me kind of back here. And that's, I, I agree with 100% with you. I, I, you know, you can't say to be good in the moment is not, it's, it's futile. It's it passing, right? And so I, I think that's, you know, that's a much better way to put it. Okay. So we've been going right about a little bit shy of an hour. So let's, um, okay. Let's wrap it up with with Coach Preston's mic drop moments. Um, so I'm a kid on a path. Mm -hmm. Shows up for tryouts, just doesn't have it. He's not. He's not even going to play JV. What do you tell him? No, the same thing. I tell my best player. I, I mean, that that kid is as important to me as this the best player on the team. We have kids that might never see the field. Uh, you know, actually one of the, one of the kids that's graduating this year, I, I'm most proud about is. We fought so hard, so hard to find this kid's position. We moved him all over the field, gave him 20 different positions, had it memorized it all. All we knew is he was just a good football player, a good kid. And, mm -hmm. and, and we wanted to make sure that we could find a way to get him on the field kind of thing. Um, he ended up, you know, he got in a couple at the end, you know, what, whatnot at the end of games type situations. Um, but 
it, you know, it, that kid to me, I could have told you as a freshman out the door, he was never going to start over the six four kid that just better than him, you know. But that was that that, that was the best teammate as we could ask for, and it, keeping him to make sure that he was still around as a senior was just as important to me as making sure the six four kid was ready to go to take a skate. Um, we had another kid who, uh, you know, I, he's let's call it a socially inept essentially he has some social problems you know not the kid you look at and say he's a football player um but he is always comes with a smile he always showed up and as a senior you know we want to make sure we could get him into games but we had to make our situations because we didn't want to get hurt kind of thing that that kind of you know you don't that kind of situation um, to the point where we put him at the end of one, the last game of the, uh, the last game before the finals, and he makes a tackle, and you've never heard. I mean, the entire stadium starts training because that kid's so loved by the community and school. Oh. And, and so, keeping those kids involved, that's what builds a football team. Um, watching our starting tailback take that kid home and to practice every day. I mean, that's just as cool to me as, again, the 6'4 kid and, you know, all these schools walking through the door coming to talk to the kid. Right. And so I, I'm not treating that kid any different, any different. I, I'm actually probably reaching out to that kid more than I would the star player. I know the star is getting well. I know that guy's going to be okay. I want to make sure that that kid makes it, makes it through his freshman year. Yeah. So can I, can I take a bit of a liberty and, and sum up a little bit what I'm hearing? It yep. sounds like which doesn't matter which side of the ball or the coach's clipboard or, or, or the classroom or life you're on. It sounds like the keys are to show up. Yeah. Every, every day. Oh. And just go on and on. Showing up. You'd be amazed what happens if you do that. Yeah. Hey, John, awesome talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank this you. Is, I hope uh, it was worth it. Um, I, I don't at all regret the, the departure <laughs> from the normal pattern. I think this is, um, I think this opens up some really good discussions. I'm really glad we did this. Very awesome. good for the time and the permission to, to put it out there. And, uh, and we'll be talking again soon. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, John. Yeah.